mind of God. He is the elucidation of the person of God. He is the extrapolation of the very existence of God. We see Jesus. He says, now you need to see that there are no angels don't compare. But then in chapter 2, he gives a warning by saying that if the word spoken by angels was important, although angels were never told, thou art my son, this day I have forgotten thee. And we make a terrible mistake. I've heard it thousands of times, and it's wrong. When people preach it and they get happy, and they tell you he'll make your enemies your footstool, sorry, he never said that to you. That was a conversation between God and his son. He told his son, you sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's not a promise to the saints. The promise to the saints is that if your ways please the Lord, he'll make your enemies be at peace with you, yeah. not your footstool. That is a statement from God to his son. That's a messianic designation that doesn't belong to the saints. He said, you are my son. He never said that to angels. Angels are flames of fire. Angels are ministering spirits. But he said when he brought him in the world, let the angels of God worship him. Chapter 2, he says, so if the word spoken by angels was secure, how shall we escape? And we neglect the salvation that was spoken by God, confirmed by those of us who heard him, backed up with miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, then he does something very interesting. He departs at that point and he begins to quote the Old Testament. He doesn't give the exact reference. He simply says, it says somewhere. He actually is using the fact that the scriptures are inspired by God. Notice what he says. He says, one has said. He's referring to two passages in the Old Testament. One in Psalm 8 and one in Psalm 110. That's now, right. if, right. you, if you look at them, it's difficult to put those two together because Psalm 8 is obviously referring to God's estimation of humankind. Right. Who is man? What is man? What is this little creature that God is so mindful of him? He has made a little lower than the angels, but yet you crown him with glory and honor. And then he begins to talk about all things being put under his feet. Now, there's a split screen here in the mind of the writer and in your mind. At the same time, he speaks once of God's estimation of man and yet he's able in a strange way to include Christ in that discussion because of his manhood. Ah, yes. Jesus was a man. He wasn't just a man, but he was a man, so as far as his humanity was concerned, Psalm 8 applies to him, and yet in a larger context, things that did not apply to Adam apply to Christ. We see Jesus. Ah, so that I want you to understand something very important here. When he says, we see Jesus, he's described what we see and don't see in the physical world, we see man. Crown, we see man, uh, how do I want to say it? A little lower than the angel. We see man who was supposed to have everything under his feet, but things ain't quite working out like they should. The eternal plan seemingly was derailed by a horrible experience in Eden. It seems as if the purpose of God did not exactly come out, but then God always has a greater plan. I didn't say a bad up plan. Not a plan B, but a greater plan because God already knew how this thing was going to turn out. He already knew what would happen, so the contingency plan was really the first plan with God. God can't have contingencies. God can't have surprises. God can't back up. God can't go to plan B. God cannot be surprised. God cannot be caught off guard. God cannot be startled. God cannot be baffled. God cannot be bamboozled. God doesn't scratch his head. God doesn't wonder what comes next. God doesn't figure how he's going to work this thing out. It's already done. Yeah. We see Jesus. And that's what I think is troubling most of us. We're not seeing Jesus.
because we're not talking about Jesus like we ought to. Mm -hmm. Let me say a few things about Jesus All right. tonight. Let me talk about Jesus. And when I compare what the writer is doing in Hebrews chapter 2, joining Psalm 8 with Psalm 110, is something we've got to do here. And I want you to know we see Jesus. Now, now, the first thing I want you to see is in the text, and, and, and that is, there was a plan uh, as king over creation. Man was supposed to be king over creation. Man was supposed to be the regent, the co-regent, the vice regent, the ruler over the earthly realm. But you know what happened to that. Adam messed things up. And I don't know if Paul wrote Hebrews or not, but I know this. There's a comparison here between the first Adam. And I always thought you ought to be careful with biblical language. I always said the second Adam. That's not what the Bible says. That's right. It says the first Adam and the last Adam. Uh -huh. Because after the last Adam, there won't be another one. We see Jesus. There's Adam in the garden, and then there's the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you how they play off of each other. One Adam got us in trouble. Another Adam got us out of trouble. One Adam got us sick. Another Adam got us well. One Adam drove us out. The last Adam brought us back. The old Adam pushed us down. The last Adam lifted us up. The old Adam drove us away from God. The last Adam built a bridge back to God. The last Adam, the first Adam ruined us. The last Adam redeemed us. The first